You are now live on air. Hello, folks. We are live once again. You are listening to <clears throat> Beyond Sight and Sound on the Detecting Lifestyle Radio Network. I am your host, Josh Kimmel, a.k.a. Treasure Seeker. And speaking of treasure, it comes in many different shapes, sizes, Varieties, types, it's an all-encompassing term, rather vague at times, and you just never know that it's, it's out there in many different forms. For some of us, it's coins. For others, it's jewelry. Maybe it's caches, sunken treasures. Maybe, uh, you know, it's estate sale hunters. Anything like that. Sometimes it's gold prospecting. Other times people like to go a little further out, a little older. Sometimes it's truly from, it's, it's truly a find that's just out of this world. Rocks. Rocks that fall from space. We never really think about that. We're usually uh, thinking about relics, coins, other artifacts. And a lot of times people like to try and compare. What's the oldest coin you've found? Oh, well, it, it's a seated dime, or it's a, a Spanish real, or... Uh, you know, something that, that's a, a BC, an ancient Roman coin. <clears throat> and those are all good finds. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to find them. But the finds can date back much, much older. And my guest tonight, you want to talk about old finds and out of this world. Man, <laughs> I've just, I've seen different pictures. I've seen some of his finds, uh, different videos that, that he's been involved with, as well as some of the episodes from the TV show Meteorite Men. And I'm very, very happy to say that tonight's guest is none other than Steve Arnold from the TV series Meteorite Men. <clears throat> he's, oh, he's been uh, hunting for meteorites for over 20 years. Veteran in meteorite hunting and quite well known in the circuit, too. Uh... Really, really interesting gentleman. Great guy to talk to. Heck of a personality. Nice guy. Knows his stuff about space rocks and, and the uh, different types of meteorites and the such that we do get. And, uh, you know, got a little bit of a uh, witty edge to it, too. It's been great talking to him. We've talked for a few minutes before the show, and I'm sure he's just going to be a uh, powerhouse guest, uh, just out of this world with the information he's got. Rather than for me to run on about it, though, we need to get him in here and get some of this information covered, because this is good stuff, folks. I mean, I've been enlightened already. <clears throat> so let's get him in here. I'd like to bring in the guest, Mr. Steve Arnold. How's it going tonight, Steve? It is going well. Thanks a lot 
for uh, the invite and that introduction. I'm sure my wife will be able to pop my big head here uh, with a uh, like a balloon after that build up. But we'll we'll try to uh, try to deliver some information uh, that will will be practical and maybe some inspiration that will uh, lead to some uh, some of your listeners out there finding some of these. Uh, Treasures from outer space, because they, they do fall everywhere. Um, they can be found anywhere um, if you know what to look for. Now, that's great, because I'm sure some people, they probably wonder, well, you know, like we had spoke before the show, they're probably going, oh, yeah, I've seen that show, or, yeah, I've heard of meteorites, but, you know, there's none around me. But then again... How do you know if there's none around you? Or how do you know that there's not any there? You know. Yeah, that 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 is a that's the big um kind of tug of war that goes on. Um uh, I I don't like to to make it sound too easy, but at the same time I don't want to make it sound like it's it's too hard. Um you know, there are some people who will um, approach me and they'll have a, a pickup truck full of, of hundreds of pounds of rocks uh, they think are meteorites and they're not. And then, you know, who knows how many people uh, kick a rock and curse at it and walk on by and, and they just they just kicked a four and a half billion old year old visitor from between Mars and Jupiter that's laying there in the path. So it, it's kind of one of those, one of those, um, and, and it's not unlike any other field of treasure hunting. Uh, the more you know, the more education you have, um, and, and qualifying and disqualifying areas, um, the, the more you know, the, the better your odds of, of finding something and at the very least not, not being distracted for too terribly long on a wild goose chase uh, when something seems a uh, uh, seems like it could be a big a big payoff and it turns out to be fool's gold if you will right right much like you said you do have to uh like with anything else you've got to be willing to put the time into it and i'm sure that uh persistence pays off if you're persistent enough in your search you will find some you just have to be persistent it may not necessarily be easy to find them at times but they are out there to be found i mean people have seen it over and over with some of yours oh yeah and and it, it happens all the time um where where somebody um will find a meteorite and probably one of the greatest joys and I, I haven't actually sat down and counted it, but I, I'm going to guess that I have been personally with somewhere between 25 and 30 people. Gee, maybe more than that when you start taking our camera crew and stuff that have um, bumped into meteorites. But to be there with someone when they found their first meteorite, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a moment they never forget. And there's a, 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 a sense of, of pride and, 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 um, just satisfaction kind of being able to pass the baton on to someone else to, to, to get to experience something that really is. And you know what? A lot of people, it wouldn't be a big deal to them. But for a lot of people, you know, especially the people that really want it, um, to, to be able to be with someone when they find the first meteorite is it's uh, a very memorable and very I memorable imagine experience. a little bit of nostalgia and a sense for yourself remembering when you had found your first uh, right. we've actually got a caller already Steve 620 area code who do we have you're on with myself and Steve Arnold caller 96-12 you're on oh, the that's air. Me. Yes. That 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 that's me, Steve. That's my number. <laughs> er, oops. Four forty. You're on the air with myself and Steve Arnold. Going once, going twice. All right. Maybe they'll call back. Maybe so. Uh, 
let's back up though for a moment and let's let the listeners know just who is Steve Arnold? How did you get your start not only with metal detecting, but as well as this uh niche of treasure hunting known as meteorite hunting? Well, I, you know, I for for like most people probably on this call of, of my generation, uh, was tremendously influenced by Indiana Jones growing up and um, had this had this uh, passion um, kind of stirred inside me to be a treasure hunter. And uh, I always, 22 years ago, I picked up a book by Charles Garrett on how to hunt for uh, treasures. And uh, uh, I was going through the different ways, you know, beach hunting and coins in a park and relics and uh, sunken uh, ship treasures and and the caches caught my attention and I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time and uh, and Oklahoma just has no history. It's, it, California was full before the first settler moved into Oklahoma. But I had grown up in Kansas and I knew there was some history in Kansas and some in the 1800s and even pre Civil War era time and so. Um, I just thought, well, I'll run up to Topeka, and, and that was one of the things the book taught me is you, you need to do research. You need to spend more time researching than you are actually out in the field. And I was like, okay. I didn't even own a metal detector at the time. Went up, started doing research, looking for places that might be, and I was open to about anything, but, but the caches were, so I was looking for disasters where maybe 10 or 20 people might have I've uh, been killed all at once, and they didn't have enough time to tell their loved ones where the where the money was stashed at on the old homestead, and um, and uh, so I I went up the historical society and started going through and um, ran across a story about a lady in 1890 that had found a meteorite and sold it to the University of Kansas, and I kind of went sold for money. Back in the 1800s, if meteorites were worth money back then, maybe they're worth money now. And and, um, and I think they've got some metal in them, so maybe a metal detector could pick them up and did a little research. And uh, sure enough, they're worth money. Sure enough, they've got some metal. And the um, story's a little longer than that. But, um, you know, I really, I, the treasure hunting and the meteorites happened at the same time. And what happened was uh, um, I started uh, researching and I started hunting for meteorites and I started finding them and selling them and making money. And I just thought, gee whiz, why, why don't you get a real job? This is, this is too much fun. <laughs> right. I can certainly understand that. So you kind of, uh, I mean, like with some of us that get into the hobby, we may get in under the pretense of being a coin shooter or something and find out a little while down the road that maybe we're relic hunters or something. And sure. it sounds like you kind of hit your niche right away. You were hooked and never stopped. That's exactly right. Well, that is definitely cool. Uh, so you did, uh, you kind of did your research. You thought meteorites might be neat to go and find. Uh, so where did Steve go from there? Did you just go out and buy any sort of detector and just happen to stumble across one, or how did that work well, for you? Yeah, um, what, the, what happened was I, I, I dove into doing research on meteorites, and, and um, I, there was a book that was published in 1950. Um, by Harvey Neininger, who is who is the 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 greatest meteorite hunter of all times, and and he, he really really deserves the honor. And um, at, at the time in 1950, more meteorites had been found in Kansas than anywhere else in the world. And there was a, a, a the policy was to name the meteorite after after the nearest community or or a landmark on a map. And of course, in Kansas, there aren't many landmarks, so it's just pretty much the nearest town. And and so they would name it after the nearest town. And I, having grown up and having had um, uh, family and, and ancestors in Kansas and around Kansas, um, I, I started recognizing a lot of the names. I think there was about 100 and 
well, at the time, I think there was about 60 in 1950, and, and uh, around 1992, when I when I stumbled onto it, there was a little over 100 bead rights had been found in Kansas. And so um, I started recognizing names of places, even little tiny towns of five or ten or fifty people. I would drive through it on the way to Grandpa's house. And and it was like, oh, I know where that is, I know where that is. And and then um, because of the scientific nature of meteorite, the, there was a more concentrated effort on recording um, who found them and where they found them and how big they were. And I learned that normally meteorites do break up into uh, multiple pieces uh, when they fly uh, through the atmosphere. So they'll break up and then they get strewn across the, the, the ground in a fairly predictable pattern. Uh, the larger ones tend to go further, the smaller ones drop off first, and so there'll be a pattern. And, and there were actual maps with X's on them where meteorites have been found in certain quarter sections and who found them and when they found them. And I go, oh my God, these, these are treasure maps. And so I started following up and going on some of those treasure and I remember the, the first time I went on, I I, I had a, a magnetometer. I got a, a ferro probe, a, a Fisher ferro probe was my first detector um, because it was supposed to pick up the irons. And, you know, 40 acres on a map does not look like very much ground. but Until you get standing, out there and start walking. Yeah, it's a lot of ground. And I, I learned really quick the my my uh the patron saint harvey Nyinger, who had written that book and um he he learned that it was a little bit easier to find the finders and so my initial niche early on was to it was easier to go find farmers and this was before the internet and before um there was a a, a big gap there was a, a very um legitimate role in the middleman to, you know a farmer could have a meteorite, and he may be pretty sure he hit one with a plow, but it's not like you go down to the grain elevator and and sell your meteorite where you'd sell your corn or your wheat. And so a lot of times meteorites just stick around until someone come along and go, you know, you want to sell it? Well, how much you give me for it? And if it's if it was enough money, the, the farmer would sell it. And so... Um, for about six years, that was my main focus, and then the hunting was a little bit more of just for the fun and the leisure of it. Um, and then through my 22 years, there's been different seasons where I've focused more and where where I would put in, you know, thousands of hours um, at a stretch of of hunting. And other times I would do more buying and selling, and sometimes more brokering, but. But always uh, opportunities would avail themselves to, to go out or a fireball would happen and all of a sudden there'd be new rocks on the ground and drop everything and take off and and go look for uh, little black rocks on top of the ground and, and other times pull out the detectors and do some deep, deep searching for meteorites. So different right. opportunities avail themselves at, at different times. Yeah, I imagine once uh, one enters the atmosphere like that, you guys are kind of on high alert, so to speak. Where's it going? When's it landing? Where's it landing? We got to get there. Yeah, it, it really is like a volunteer fire department. You're kind of just on standby. Uh, you never know wh where, when or where it's going to happen. And, you know, the real big challenge is is to to disqualify targets, disqualify the falls as, um, you know, if there's, because, and, and I'll tell you what, to be honest, I've, I've been on, I've been on a bit of a, I, I think the last nine meteorite fireballs I've chased, I've come up empty handed. So, um, oh. and, and a couple, and a couple of those other people were successful around me. So, um, it, it's, it's not always, um, easy. And, um, but, you know, it's, it's also, I, I compare it to, you know, someone who might be nugget shooting for five or ten years and they might find a little something here, a little something there, and all of a sudden they find a nice vein and all of a sudden, you know, 
uh, for a stretch there, they might be finding ten thousand dollars worth a day, and oh wow, it sounds good, sounds easy, and like you're rich, but um, right. Some you know, days are certainly better than others, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Eight four seven, you're on the air with myself and Steve Arnold. Who do we have? Hey, Josh, how are you? Yeah, this is Craig Stryker from Illinois. Ah, Craig, how's it going? Pretty good. Steve, I know you don't remember me. It was a couple of years ago. You were at that uh, mine lab hunt in uh, the dunes of Indiana. Yes, well, I remember the event. I don't necessarily <laughs> remember you. Oh, no. No, I, I, I don't stick out unless I'm in a crowd. <laughs> well, as a, as a good treasure hunter should be able to blend in, right? That's right. <laughs> but no, but uh, I did find one. I found. Uh, I ended up finding one. Uh, a small meteorite in uh, Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. And uh, I talked to a few people in Wisconsin. I didn't send it down there. Um, they were they were actually confused. They was they was telling me because it is it does have iron in it. It was either a part of a meteorite or it was a glacier rock. Okay. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so and, just... and glaciers glaciers have um, have had a a tremendous influence on on meteorites um, in the path of where they've been. The, the glacial moraine will will turn meteorites under, um, and not only that, um, for ones that have fallen more recently, they hmm. tend to blend in. So if you have a farmer. Um, say in Minnesota, who has, you know, oh, a million rocks per acre, um, hitting a rock with his, his plow is not a big deal. You get out in the panhandle of Texas, um, where there are no rocks whatsoever, you hit a rock and, and it ends up a big deal. At the very least, you take it home and you go, son, look what I found. And what's that, dad? It's a rock. What's a rock? Because he's never exactly. seen a rock before in his life. Well, you know, so it's a lot easier for rocks, to, to meteorites, to be ignored um, and just to get lost in, in the shuffle with all the other ones. And so doesn't mean they're not there. Um, it does mean they might be 10 or 20 or 30 feet deep in some spots, too. So um, it, it's, uh, it, it presents a little bit of a challenge, but... Um, Nonetheless, it's it's if uh, if you know what to look for, um, they they're there. They're they're found on a fairly regular exactly. basis. Exactly, exactly. They were clearing for a subdivision, and they were they removed four to five feet of topsoil. And I got wow. permission to go out there and check, and that's how I hit it. And uh, I, I haven't had it cut yet. You know, to be a hundred percent sure. And okay. that's what I need, that's what I need to have done. But it's, I mean, I got, uh, I, I got some pictures posted on my site on Facebook. And w what's so interesting about it, I'm sure you've seen these. It has, uh, even though it's about, oh, a size and a half of a golf ball, it has the stress cracks in it where it has gravel that got trapped inside of it, almost like when it was cooling. You know, so okay. it, it's, well, it's a pretty good rock, you know. Okay. Now, what, one thing to give you, uh, give you and the other listeners a couple, a couple little lessons here, um, to, to debunk what, what Hollywood has, has, uh, corrupted our brains with. Um, mm -hmm. meteorites do not hit the ground on fire. In fact, they do not hit the ground hot. Um, they are cold and, and oftentimes if someone is very nearby when a meteorite lands, they go over and look at it. Frost will 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 be forming on it. Um, the oh, exact wow. opposite, and and the reason for this is the the meteorite is coming from outer space at very close to absolute zero in temperatures. Um, for a few seconds, from a second to two or three or four seconds, maybe five at the longest, um, it's in the middle of a fireball. But it's but it's melting now. Rocks don't catch on fire. When you see a fireball, and we had a we had a shower here uh, night night before last, um, a comet shower where it, once a year we're we're hitting the Orionids, the the the, the 
comet that had come by and, and some of the debris once a year we'd go to the, 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 where the tail of the comet went by. Um, right. It's the, the, what you see, the light phenomenon is the oxygen in the air burning. Oxygen burns, rocks don't burn. And right. so then they burn out five to ten miles up, and then they have a two to three to four minute free fall at about 50 degrees below zero. So it's not really until the last mile or so before it starts to warm up. And, um, and even then, you're, you're only talking a few seconds at that point. And so the, the rock is usually still very cold. And, and so, um, oftentimes if people think, oh, it, it should be bubbly, it should be like lava. Well, there's no air in space, so there's not going to be any, any air bubbles in a rock. So that very, very often will be one of the disqualifying um, factors and the, the things we are looking for in a meteorite. Um, the initial definitive test is nickel and iron together, and about 98 okay. percent of the meteorites will have nickel and iron alloy together. That combination does not happen on Earth, and and so you can test for iron with a magnet. Uh, you can do a little simple nickel test that uh, jewelry stores even sell for people that are allergic to nickel and jewelry. Do a nickel test that way. Um, the the two percent that that don't have iron in them, very 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 seldom um, are, are they found in the U.S. Unless it's witnessed to fall um, or in a very deserted environment, and those will almost always have a black shiny glass crust on them. Um, the composition it makes it uh, really almost like a black obsidian. Um, on the surface. So if it's not a shiny black or a magnet doesn't um, uh, jump to it, then um, you can rest pretty um, pretty sure it's not going to be a meteorite. If a magnet does stick or if there's some other characteristics that make you think it might be a meteorite, then it usually needs to, to get into a laboratory to be tested to verify it. No, that's awesome. I appreciate it. You know, a magnet does stick to it, but like the guy in Wisconsin, the professor, or what I forgot his name, uh, did say it's most likely six, seven, eight thousand years old, something like that, being a meteor rock because of the color. It's like a, like a rust brown color. And, sure. uh, he explained everything. He was, he was really awesome on the phone. I mean, this guy's really busy. He travels all over the place. He works for the, uh, meteorologist department in Wisconsin. And, uh, okay. you know, I, I, I thought I was pretty honored, you know, just him taking the time out and responding to my email. And, uh, yeah, he, he, yeah. Had, he, he had, he had good advice to me. I was so excited and couldn't wait to and talk to him. And the first words out of his mouth were, next time you take a picture, put a quarter next to it so I can judge the size. <laughs> size reference. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Crap. Yeah. So, but, uh, well, typical, I, I'm, I'm typical trust, professor. I'm trusting, yeah. I'm trusting your photos were actually in focus. That, that's my, my pet peeve is, is yes, yeah, something for scale, but, People yep. will send me pictures that are that are not in focus, and it's like, come on, folks, this isn't 20 years ago where you had to go to Walmart and wait three days. And even if you did, you'd still take another picture and send me one that's in focus. It does, there's no one any good to see one that's out of focus. So, um, but anyway, well, congratulations, and you know, it's Thank not, you. here's a good example of of somebody who probably didn't pay much attention. Uh, uh, to the possibility bumps into me, um, at a mine lab event up, uh, up in, uh, Indiana here a couple years ago. I must yep. have said something stuck in the back of your head. You ran across <laughs> something and instead of being a hot rock that you just threw aside, uh, you, you, you know, you picked it up and you said, wow, what if? And so that's the power of a little bit of knowledge. Exactly. Well, like I said, I appreciate your time and, uh, Josh, I appreciate your show, Beyond Sight and Sound, and as usual, it's a great show. You have great guests on there, and uh, thank you both for taking my call. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the call, Greg. All right. Happy hunting. Wow. And and those are good points, too, especially covering on the uh, fall of the atmosphere, because 
I am, uh, and I could be slightly confused, and by all means, correct me if I'm wrong, but like you said, when they're falling through the atmosphere, the the fireball that we see isn't necessarily that the rock itself is burning, it's the friction that's being created by the fall. It's causing the oxygen to burn, and then once it gets a little closer to Earth, it goes into what they refer to as dark flight what? before it actually kind of uh, breaks apart and and hits the ground, and then everybody's out there trying to find it. But right. just because it sticks to a magnet doesn't necessarily mean it's a meteorite either. This is true. Uh, you you a lot of uh, a lot of slag. Obviously, there's man-made metals from nails to fence posts to really rusted, gnarly farm machinery that's broken um, to to rocks. Even granite will have some iron in it at times. And hematite and magnetite are a couple of the uh, earth rocks that uh, pay a lot of uh, havoc with the people's hopes and dreams. Um, they're out there uh, pricing, you know, a new Cadillac and it's like, I'm sorry, you just have a uh, hematite there. <laughs> right. Sometimes it, it takes a while. You've got to be persistent. But like you said, sometimes it's just that that thought that sticks with them. Like with Craig's case, he ran into you at a Mind Lab event. And then uh, that kind of kept him thinking. And he's going, hey, what if this could be one? I shouldn't just toss right. it to the side. I should investigate this further. Yep. One one of the um, one of our episodes from our first season was with the uh, at the Gold Basin um, field up by Lake Mead, northern Arizona, and um, uh, very, very one of my favorite episodes. And and you can go catch it on uh, on YouTube if you're not you know in, in one to run and wait for science to rerun that one. But um, that was discovered by a gold prospector. Uh, who, who happened to just look at one of the hot rocks up there and went, you know, this kind of looks like a meteorite. And it's a, a fairly weathered meteorite. And so, and it's not as, some of them have a little bit more of the crust, look a little more like a typical meteorite. And others are pretty gnarly looking from that same fall. And, um, I was doing, uh, I was selling, uh, about a year ago up in, uh, up in, uh, Illinois, um, at a, a, a rock show and a guy came up and he told me that he had, um, he had hunted, uh, for gold out at Gold Basin for years. And, and then, uh, somewhere around 97 or 98, 99 is when word broke that there were meteorites being found out there. And so he went back out to hunt for gold one year. And he parked his RV in the same spot he had parked it for like the last 15 years. And, um, he, he went out with his medic because he knew he had these hot rocks and he'd go back to the, back to the, um, to the RV and he'd look at them closely and go, no, there's no gold in it. And he'd throw them about as far as he could throw out the door of the RV. And he went out and ended up picking up about 30 meteorites that over the years he had thrown away. Um, wow. A, a stone's throw from where he parked his RV every year. And um, that was kind of the joke out there is that a lot of times meteorites would be found right up in the bushes because when people would be looking for gold, they'd find a hot rock. They'd want to toss it kind of out of the way where some they or someone else may not run into it quite as easy the next time around. And so uh, that was kind of the rules to keep your eyes peeled in and around the bushes, even if your detector can't get up there because someone may have found it before you and tossed it away. So, And I imagine that's where the feeling of sickness starts to set in because in some cases, meteorites are actually more lucrative than gold. Sure, yeah. Some, some of those, uh, yeah, you, you find a four or $500 uh, meteorite and, and uh, you throw that away and you get all excited over your $30 little nugget. Right. Uh, we've got another caller. Go ahead. You're on the air with myself and Steve Arnold. 
Hi, Steve and Josh. This is Ring Finder. Ah, Mr. Morrison. You got it, buddy. Hey, Steve, I got a question. How about a lone stone, load stone rock? What about it? Well, it's a magnetized rock. Yes, it is. Is it a meteorite? No. I didn't think so. At our <laughs> Allen County Museum here in Ohio, we actually have some of those rocks here with nails stuck to them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And and the, the term magnetic is is if you go to the dictionary it can it can actually mean attract um, 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 a magnet or is magnetized where, where metal is attracted to it and, and meteorites, uh, yeah, they don't suck metal to them, but, um, they will suck a magnet to them. It's, it, they're a ferrous rock. And, and it's one of those things that for the people who detect, um, and where they're discriminating out the, uh, the iron, um, you, you may not even know that you're missing the meteorites. Um, because you want to go in a all metal mode, right? right one here. of those situations where you do really want to open up your discrimination pattern and dig those low signals. Yes. Right. You know, I was hunting with a. This would be a good machine for what you're talking about, and that's my Nautilus machine. Because uh, even in the on the left side where it's supposed to be good, it'll pick up a hot rock any day of the week. So. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know if you've ever hunted with one of those, but I bet that'd be good out. I don't know. It's probably mineralized pretty much where you hunt. I would imagine they're here in Ohio. Have you ever found one, Josh? No, I have not, but I've always been fascinated by the whole subject and would like to try my hand at it sometime. Well, I've found a lot of hot rocks, so must be close. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I recommend for people, um, you know, if you're... Go find where another meteorite has already been found. They usually do break up. And especially if there's an area where 50 pieces have been found, pretty good chance there's a 51st piece waiting to be found. And in the case of the gold nuggets, well, um, there's the Gold Basin area, there's the Franconia area in Arizona, um, a couple different places up in, in Nevada. Um, if you're looking for both, you can kind of, you might get lucky with one or the other, or, or in some cases, uh, with both. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're relic hunting, well, find a, a meteorite strewn field that's known and go look for relics and meteorites in the same, same area. Um, you know, I, Probably your odds of finding a meteorite on a beach is going to be pretty slim, but um, there were meteorites found in Acapulco and one in um, Honolulu, so it's, it's not entirely impossible. Got a question for you, Steve. You ever hunt with Jeffrey N Notkin? <laughs> I've hunted with Jeff a few times, yes. I have his book in front of me right now. I want it uh, on one of the other... Uh, Sight, or not sighting down, one of the other thousand mic places, which would be uh, Relic Roundup. And he was on uh -huh. that show, and I actually won this book, and it is awesome. Uh, yeah, have you ever, very, have you ever very, wrote a Pardon me, Steve? Have I what? Have you ever wrote a book? You know, I, I am in the middle of writing a book. Um, Co-writing um, with another gentleman that has a lot more skill and talent in and actually writing the language and we're, we're conspiring together and we're about halfway done. Um, there's a magazine called Meteorite Magazine and, and our first three or four chapters have been published in that magazine, um, over the, over the past year. Uh, and so eventually we'll get to that. I am also working on, and it's been, it's, there's been a little bit of a, a postponement here. But I am working on a meteorite hunting home study course. And, um, I know all the information. Um, my, my ability to put it in writing is a, is a little bit challenging. Um, although I, I, eventually it'll probably end up both in writing and in video format. But our television series has done a good job of, 
of motivating people to want to find meteorites, although that was not the intention. The intention was to make an entertaining show that people would tune in and advertisers would pay to advertise on. Um, but the byproduct has been people who got, ooh, I'd like to go do that. Now, it's one thing to say you'd want to do it, and then there's another thing to really want to go do it. And so I think there's a void out there. Um, and so hopefully within the next couple months, um, I'll get um, uh, the first module out, which will be on how to do fireball chases. And then uh, we'll work around to hunting the older, the older known stream fields and then how to just, you know, have a cold find. And so, um, kind of the three, the three main ways to hunt for meteorites and address them one at a time. And, uh, the fireballs are a little bit exciting because you never know when or where it's going to happen. But when it does happen, um, it's like a little gold rush. People, people want to run in and, and, uh, <laughs> And sometimes, sometimes it can be easy if you got a rock just laying right in the middle of the road and you drive up on it. I got a question for you, Steve. I arrowhead hunt, and uh, my rock, my, my rock, my wife is always getting on me for bringing rocks home. How do you get away with that at home? I mean, you must have a big building for all these things. Well, you know, um, I from from day one, see, I got I got involved in meteorites because well. I, I, well, my treasure hunting, I, I was leaning toward the caches because I I was scared from what I read early on before I even bought my first detector on the warning. Don't don't think you're going to get rich being a treasure hunter because even if you find stuff that's worth a fortune, you're likely to never want to sell it and you'll, you'll keep every <laughs> pull tab and every ring and every penny you ever found and you'll put it in boxes and your garage will fill up. So don't think you're going to get rich. Your heirs might get rich once you die and they sell it all off, but <laughs> you probably won't. Well, that was the promise of the cash is, well, hey, you know, if there's, if there's a jar full of silver dimes or, or a, a roll of, you know, uh, of old $20 gold certificate, I'll spend that. I, I, there's no ma- emotional attachment to a coffee can full of money. And, and so when I approached meteorites, it was like, hey, this is a way to make money and, and a way to fund me going out and finding more. So I don't have a personal collection. Everything I have is, is inventory. Now, um, I, I work, uh, we, my wife and I, we run uh, the only brick-and-mortar meteorite store in America in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And um, so we do have some inventory uh, of things for sale. But, um, yeah, my, for, as far as my wife's concerned, um, usually she has a say um, if, if something um, um, gets purchased. And, and if it's something I find, well, she celebrates with me. Um, I, I got to say, if I, if I found a CS buckle, it would not be for sale. It would be in my collection, and you could keep all the rocks and whatever. <laughs> and, but I do have a lot of neat arrowheads, and uh, I haven't sold any yet, but uh, maybe someday. May, maybe yeah, somebody I, else will sell them when I die. Well, and that's a good point. And, and there is the scientific angle to meteorites, and and the value, the real value in a meteorite is the information that it contains. And so, um, not that there's necessarily a moral obligation to get a piece to science. And to be honest, most meteorites are not really all that valuable to scientists, although we usually don't know until at least a piece gets in and gets studied. Right. Um, but, but if you've watched our series, um, on TV, um, we've every once in a while we'll come up with something we think's just as boring and normal and ordinary as it can get. If you can call a meteorite boring or normal or ordinary, <laughs> and out of the blue there'll be something different or unusual or something the scientists yeah. have never seen before, and you go, "Wow, that that kind of feels good." That yeah. you know, I'm out here trying to make a buck, but I'm helping to advance science just a little bit along the way, and. If I can sell something and that affords me to get back out and go do some more hunting and I find something else and next time it is something that is scientifically valuable or more so than the last one that went to the collectors, then, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a team effort here. Very good. Thank you, Steve. And, uh, Josh, another good show. I'll let somebody else call in.
All right. Thanks for the call. Yep. Good night. Uh, go ahead, caller. You're on the air with myself, and uh, <clears throat> we will get rid of that. I don't know. Sounds like someone's calling in. Yeah, I'm not sure what that was. We'll take this opportunity and take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Are you a metal detecting enthusiast looking for a new machine? Maybe you're just getting started in the hobby and you're not sure what machine to get. Get down to earth and into the dirt. Contact Mike, the Buckeye Hunter of MT Detector Sales. Mike is an authorized, multi-line dealer of MineLab, Garrett, Technetics, and Tesoro. Don't deal with someone who may not even hunt. Mike sells what works and uses the brands he sells. Specializing in such models as the MineLab E-Track, CTX 3030, Garrett AT Pro, and Tesoro Outlaw. Get down to earth and into the dirt with MT Detector Sales. MTDetectorSales.com Now, I guess another good thing to cover would be that sometimes you don't necessarily need real fancy equipment to go out and do this sort of stuff. I mean, it's just research... Uh, like you said earlier, you found some uh, some maps that documented where meteorites had fallen, and in that particular situation, X really does mug the spot, so to speak, and right. that you can go out and do it with tools as simple as the metal detector you're already using and a magnet. Sure, and, and oftentimes, well, for example, um, eight days ago, um, over uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, a fireball came in, and it was cloud cover. So no one was in the afternoon. No one actually saw the fireball. They heard the loud explosion, and um, it dropped rocks um, just a little bit outside of Marshall, Texas. And so wow. um, uh, a friend of mine uh, that's an expert at, at evaluating Doppler radar um, pulled up some Doppler radar, and there were some very distinctive meteorite hits and so um, um, after it was within one hour of getting the news from him I was headed south um, to Marshall Texas to go look I didn't even bring a metal detector with me because it was uh, my goal there was to go out um, drive around look on the roads look on the streets um, and and see if there were meteorites laying on the ground because it it was a promising looking uh, uh, fall and uh, there's um, it, it was one of those situations where I literally only had about nine hours um, seven hour drive down I ended up taking an hour and a half power nap drove around for about nine hours and then drove home all within twenty four hours and wow. um, and. Empty-handed, but but right now I had a magnet, a uh, rare earth magnet, uh, and and then I was looking for a little black rock, or if I was really lucky, a big black rock um, laying on a road or on a street or you know in, in an area where uh, something could be spotted. And ended up uh, coming home empty-handed. Uh, we're we're hopeful that um, something you know still might turn up there. Um, but, um, yeah, you don't always need, uh, you don't always need a detector. And we, we have the, uh, dry lake bed episode where we did that. Um, uh, our chili episode, even though we did use some detectors, um, uh, part of that was done uh, with magnets and part of that was done visual. Uh, a lot of the fireballs oftentimes, you know, you're, you're, especially if, if it, there's some areas where, if it, there was a meteorite that exploded over the south suburbs of Chicago in 2003 and, and, uh, Crete, Steger and Park Forest, um, Illinois, uh, were pelted with rocks. There were eight houses that were hit with cannonball sized rocks and, and there were rocks in the street and in the road. And I, I, I rode around on a bicycle and found 117 meteorites, most of them just right there in the, in the road. Wow. Um, and, uh, and up there in the industrial, um, area of Chicago, a metal detector is worthless. You look at a nice green park or, uh, you know, the, the grass spot, you know, at the high school, it looks all nice and pretty and pristine. And it's like every swing you, you're getting aluminum and you're getting iron and you're getting all, you know, hundreds of years worth of trash. 
underneath the surface. And that's obviously I'm preaching to the choir here because most of uh, us here in Listeners are, have, have experienced that frustration. So you're looking for iron mixed in with a bunch of iron trash. Um, yeah, you might as well just leave it at home. Right. Uh, we had a caller try to come through. I kind of missed him there. Uh, 8142, though, if you call back, we'll get you back in. Uh, I guess another thing, too, would be that... Uh, you said before, you know, we, we, you would go and talk to other farmers and stuff. Have you noticed the research being any easier for you with the advent of the internet and the, the, uh, more popular interest that has been generated in the meteorite field as of recent? Oh, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's always been, it's always been a flexible situation where where one farmer's open to it and the other one's not. Um, you know, in this in this day of um, um, lawsuits and that kind of thing, um, a lot of farmers uh, are just not interested in letting anyone on their ground for any reason because they don't want you to fall and you know break your ankle and sue them for a million dollars. So um, you have that. On the other hand. Um, you know, a lot of times farmers are, are not in a position where they're able to to take the time to stop and go look for something. So you, you present an opportunity to do it really almost as a service for them. Um, they're open. The, the TV show has helped in some respects. It's, it's hurt in others. Um, me being a, a, a host of a, a personality um, helps in some situations. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Suppose, I'm sure it and, would. Yeah. So I, I, my personal experience is a little bit skewed. Obviously, information is is more available now than ever. Um, on the other hand, information is available to everyone now more than ever. So right. Um, just like any other good lead, Jesse James lockbox, you know, is rumored to be buried out there on the back forty. Which you don't know. Did someone just make that story up? Because they're trying to sell that back forty. 80 years ago and you know the the the, the promise of a lockbox full of gold uh helps that 40 acres be worth a lot more oh yeah 50 years ago someone <laughs> ran across and find that lockbox and they didn't want to report it to the irs so they didn't bother to tell everyone that oh i already found it and it's not there anymore so right kind of the same way with meteorite 81 42 you're on the air with myself and steve arnold hey josh it's long researcher Oh, Swansea, uh, it's it's great that you actually called. Uh, we'll get to your question and comment here in a minute, but I do want to let you know that here in a couple of days, you can probably be expecting a call from me. Oh, boy, that doesn't sound good. Well, I may have some information for you, sir. Oh, that would be, I, I assume you're referring to the ring, if that's the case. I'd yes, be sir. more than ecstatic. Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, I have a question for your guest. I enjoyed the show tonight, and I had a question that's probably out there on the Internet that I had not looked up. I have been to Meteor Crater in Arizona, and I wanted to ask your guest, what size meteor or meteorite caused a crater that size to be put into the Earth, and what size was it estimated before it probably entered our atmosphere? Not to mention oh, where it hit. It was probably bigger than that before it hit because it breaks up some after it hits the atmosphere. Right, and that's kind of well, what I was trying to figure out what the ratio is. Yeah, let me let me back up and and answer that question uh, in a broader sense, so so it can educate people. Um, because a lot of people they see a fireball, oh oh, I, let's go look for a crater, you know, or you see a shooting star or. Or someone tells you about a, they were driving home and this ball of fire landed and it landed right out in that field and they want to go out there and look for a burnt spot and and um, uh, the vast majority of meteorites um, are meteors. The light phenomenon that you see are the little blips that are less than a second long, where where a hundred percent of the rock vaporizes. And even something as little as a grain of sand or something the size of a golf ball. Um, can make a huge fireball and, and go out quickly. 
if if it lasts between a second and five seconds, it it's likely to be a meteorite that that has some stuff substance that could have put something on the ground. If it lasts longer than five seconds, um, it's usually space junk, um, satellites reentering, um, um, rocket booster type stuff that comes in at enough of an angle that and it takes a long time, you know, six, seven, ten, twenty, thirty seconds to burn up. That's not going to be a meteorite. Now, of the ones that do break up and come in, usually 95% of the rock will ablate away. Sometimes 99, not uncommon for 100% of the rock to totally vaporize. Some of the biggest, brightest flashes with the biggest sonic booms um, often will have 100%. It, it it breaks into a million pieces, and those million pieces are blade away in a fraction of a second. So as bright as something is, is not always the, de- the, defining, the defining characteristics of something to chase after. Meteor Crater in Arizona is in a little teeny tiny niche of where um, if, if a rock is big enough to make a crater that is a mile and a half wide, two kilometers in diameter, 100% of the rock is going to vaporize. So you get some, there's a few craters out there that are um, 20 miles across or 10 miles across. Nothing survived. There's no rocks in the bottom of the hole. There's no rocks on the side. It vaporizes. It's like shooting a bullet. They do ballistic tests sometimes where they send a, a projectile into a, a wall and, and it, it just vaporizes. And, and that's what happens in this phenomenon. The, 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 then you have a lot larger group that comes in, it breaks up, and then it doesn't cause a crater. Maybe the rock is big enough that it punches a hole in the ground, but it's the size of the rock. And, uh, kind of like, you know, um, Tom and Jerry going through the door. There's, there's a, whatever the size of the rock is, that's the size of the hole. Hell of a now, reference, I guess. But. Ch- the Chelyabinsk uh, fall that happened a year and a half ago in Russia, as big as that was, and it blasted out um, windows, and 1,500 people went to the hospital, and everyone saw it. You know, the videos on the dash cams of, of, of people there. That was so big, yet it did not make a crater. <laughs> So the one at Canyon Diablo in Arizona, Meteor Crater, um, it's 4,000 feet across, and they estimate the body was about 50 feet in diameter. So the length of a school bus, fatter than a school bus, but, you know, about that 50 feet in diameter makes a 4,000-foot diameter hole. Wow. So, Unbelievable. Um, and, and probably... Less than half of that ablated away. I mean, it was so big that, um, you know, yeah, some of it melted away. A few pieces did break off ahead of time, but for the most part, the biggest chunk made it, made it to the ground and exploded, ripped itself to pieces, throwing the pieces within a five mile diameter of the crater. So, um, no. Yeah, if, if someone says, I know where there's a crater, I, I go, great, wonderful, I'm not interested in going. Yeah, and there's a few exceptions. You want to go see the uh, 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 White Court episodes of Meteorite Man. That was a new crater that formed a thousand years ago. I say you know, it was newly found. Um, we were able to find pieces just because we were some of the first people there. Uh, um, now that that. That now, there's still some pieces to be found, but it's been really picked over. Our Monoraki crater um, episode in one of our uh, Chile episode, we did two episodes, went to four different sites in Chile. There's a crater there. Morasco crater in Poland. Henbury craters in um, in in Australia. Those were the episodes that that focused on us going to craters and. Um, uh, the nice thing on the craters, though, they usually are the all-iron. Only about 2% of meteorites are all metal. If you go to your local museum and they have any type of a meteorite collection, 
They usually have a, a disproportionate amount of all metal meteorites. Um, they tend to be a little bit bigger. They tend to break up, you know, into chunks of pieces that um, are bigger. And and when a plow hits, a, you know, a hundred pound chunk of iron, it's a little easier to go. Wait a minute, what is this thing? Versus uh, hitting a, you know, maybe a, even a hundred pound stone meteorite can kind of go. Oh wow, okay, it's a rock and it gets thrown. Chunks of metal are a little bit more, a little more spotted. Um, and noticed, uh, historically at least, um, recently a lot more meteorites. And it, usually the, that, the credit there goes to the Sahara Desert and the, and the meteorites that are found down in Antarctica on the ice sheets. Um, they, they just tend to be a higher proportion of snow. Oh, that winded me. I hope I didn't put everyone to sleep. No, no, not at all. Know? Oh, that was very interesting. I was just trying to figure out roughly what size would create like you said, a mile and a half wide crater in the desert. And I was trying to figure out also, here's a secondary question to you. What, how do you grant a right? And of course I'm not into this, but how do you grant the right to go in there and detect these pieces of that meteorite at the same time? And have, have these pieces been found? And, you know, how do you go about documenting that this is the meteor crater in Arizona? This is where it came from. How do you go about that type of situation? Well, most most meteorites, um, the, the there's usually enough differences to distinguish one meteorite fall from a different one, um, or to pair it up. These came in as one rock; it broke up into two pieces. You know, this piece was found a year ago. This piece was found last week. They match up. Um, if, if you're in an area where thousands of pieces are being found within a couple miles and it all looks the same, you can sort of jump to the conclusion, okay, yeah, these are pieces of that fall. Um, if, if there was just one and there's a diff- another one that comes in, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good practice to get the new piece tested because it is possible that the, you could have two meteorites from two different falls being found in very close proximity. And um, the, the last tests that are done will will pair it up. Um, if, it's, if it's in the same type of meteorite, and there's going to be roughly 50 different types of meteorites, um, if it's in one of the same 50, um then then it's a little easier for them to just go, okay, yeah, they are probably from the same fall. If it's from a totally different type, then it's totally different. If if there's some reason to go, wow, yeah, this is an L5 and that's an L5, uh, and that's a type that's a very common type of meteorite, uh, you can look at it and go, you know, they look different. Or something in some of the initial testing goes, oh, wow, this it's the same came from the same parent body in space, most likely, but probably landed at different times, um, maybe went through a, other, other, you know, breaking up in space and going through different uh, uh, changes in space before landing on Earth, maybe different um, terrestrialization, weathering is different um, because they landed at different times than, um, than well, the scientists would go, ah, oh, let's look at this a little closer, but... Um, guys that are a lot more are a lot smarter than I am are um, able to handle those. Meanwhile, I just go back out and look for more. <sighs> All right. Okay, I, I appreciate the info, and Josh, I assume that I'm going to be hearing from you soon. I'd like to know what you found out about uh, I've read the ring. I assume. hopefully with some good news. <laughs> I hope the hell so. It's it's been a long struggle, but hey, great guest. I appreciate his info. I was just curious about Meteor Crater. It's the only place I've ever been to to actually see the impact on the United States from a meteor. And I've just I've thought about that since I was 16 years old, saying, what the hell created this kind of an indent in the ground? Right. And I think he just gave me my answers. Uh, thanks for the call, Swansea. <laughs> and, right. and let Have me a good night, guys. Let me... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, great, great talk to you. Thanks for the question. And let me throw in real quickly here that that um, the, the the people out at Meteor Crater 
they do not give permission for people to go hunt. Um, and oh, good and point. part of it is, is they make oh, something like $13 million a year off of their ticket sales, and they don't want to say, oh, yeah, sure, you can hunt, and you break your leg and you sue them for $13 million. So um, they basically have a policy, no hunting allowed, and, and I've respected that, and not everyone has. Um, I, I just figure, you know, the planet's pretty big, and there's other places to go hunt. There's, it's not worth going to jail over over a over a rock. So, um, which brings up a whole different topic of, of uh, meteorites. Generally, do you know belong to the people who own the land? Uh, and in the case of federal government, they do put certain claims in certain situations. Private property, um, you need to get permission to hunt and permission to take and keep or split what you find. A whole different topic there. Right. And how do they determine where this, okay, what meteor actually hit it? I mean, how do they determine that if they're not going to allow people to go out there and say, okay, this is a fragment of this exact meteorite, how do they do that if they're not going to allow anyone to do it? Do they hire a private agency to go out there and do it, or is it a government agency? Or Well, in, in that particular case, it, it's sort of checkerboard with BLM land and and Arizona has some kind of weird BLM rules in certain areas, and then the other stuff's private property. And of course, on private property, they can, they, they just like anybody else. Uh, you know, if someone wants to come in your backyard and hunt, um, they pro- probably should ask for permission. Um, you know, uh, and and that's the same way there. So their prerogative is they don't want people hunting, and so uh, people don't get a hunt, and. And uh, you can still go out there and buy a ticket and go look at the hole in the ground, which I strongly recommend people do. It's it's, uh, it's uh, an awe-inspiring um, feature that uh, the best preserved meteor crater um, on the planet. And um, until you're standing, you you think gee whiz, really a hole in the ground? Um, you go out there and you look at it and you just go, wow, you know, something up there did this, you know. Oh, and, uh, and that's much more entertaining to me. I, I've been to the Grand Canyon National Park, and when I was out there in Tempe, Arizona for college, I saw a meteor crater. I've been to Old Tucson. The meteor crater was much more of a question in my head as to how it was formed. Of course, the Colorado River created the Grand Canyon, whatever. But to me, that was much more fascinating. So many years ago, you know, I was 19 years old, said I saw this giant freaking hole in the ground, how the hell was this created? And of course, you just explained it to me. It, it's much more entertaining to me than seeing a river carve a path through a canyon. Well, me too. But you know, I I just talk about I'm um, just kind of crazy and and yeah. uh, uh, but whatever. And, and, and I'm not I'm not saying I'm not crazy, and I'm not saying you're not crazy either. But um, you know, one of the fun things about meteorites um, and the treasure hunt for them is that oftentimes. One question is answered, and it, it introduces uh, two or three new questions that need to be answered. And so, um, you know, um, one question is, what, is there another piece of it? And if so, where where is it? And then sometimes it goes off into uh, into some really um, cerebral areas of the brain where um, uh, researchers will will argue and 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 uh, you know examine under a microscope and. And, and sort of, well, if, if, you know, this, this situation had to have happened on this asteroid for this to be able to happen. And, uh, you know, it's a process of elimination and, and every once in a while new, new, uh, new questions are answered and, and it's, it's a rewarding side benefit. Oh, yeah. To doing oh, I'm sure. I mean, and, the amount of research you must do to be able to figure out where this, meteorite came from or whatever just to figure out the timeline behind it is it, it's got to be phenomenal i mean just trying yeah. to research a ring find for me for, oh, since april has been phenomenal but what you guys do you're you're talking thousands of years worth of development for for it to come from a rock from space to come to the earth to burn up inside the atmosphere to go to the ground i couldn't even imagine <laughs> Just being able to figure out how the hell this happens and what you guys do, and I've watched your show, I'm a big fan of your show, I don't even realize how you guys have that capability of tracing back 
so many thousands of years worth of things when I can't even do it over 40 years. <laughs> well, it thanks is, for the call, Swansea. It is incredible. I, I agree. See, and, you, and, know, and, you guys I, do a phenomenal thing. And I, and I thought I was going to come on here and have to talk people into liking the idea of, 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 of meteorites. And, and they're, they're already hooked. You know, exactly. You have no idea. I mean, many of these guys at Metal Detect see what you do, and they say, holy shit, I've been trying to find the history behind something for such a, I guess I could say a short period of time, over three, four hundred years. You're doing thousands of years worth of research in such a short period of time. It's, it just, it's mind-blowing, to be honest with you. Absolutely. Well, hey, I appreciate it, guys. I just wanted to sit on here and ask about Meteor Crater because that's one of the only things I've ever seen in my life that I cannot explain to myself, even looking on the Internet. It doesn't make any sense because, of course, there's a bunch of mumble-jumble out there. But, no, I appreciate what you do. Josh, great guest. I love talking to you. I love your shows. But I just really had some serious questions about trying to figure out the history behind when these things impact the Earth and how they happen and you know, the the kind of impact that that has on our Earth that most people don't even think about. Absolutely. It's such a small item. Yep. Okay. Well, we appreciate the call, and we'll see you, Swansea. All right. I appreciate it, Josh. Well, at least it sounds like there was enlightenment there. <laughs> yes. And that's always a plus. We've, we've ran over a little bit, but real quick, if you can, uh, you know, you talk about some of these are small, some of them are big, but in, uh, what, 2005, 2006, somewhere in that range, you ran across a bit of a whopper. I did, yes. Um, I, I, I joked um, that, you know, I was a 13-year overnight success. Um, 2005, I was... Uh, Hunting for meteorites. Uh, and that, now here's a little bit of an irony for you. The lady who found the, the meteorite back in 1890 that I ran across in my research, I was hunting meteorites less than a mile from her property, from her homestead. Hmm. And, um, I went back to the site where she found hers and I, uh, I hit a, hit a signal and, um, didn't, I, it was a big signal, but, you know, is it a big rock close to the ground uh, or maybe a smaller rock closer to the top? Is it bigger, deeper? You, you, all, you, you all can relate. Um, but it was enough. We uh, got a backhoe out and dug down and, yeah, under seven feet, four inches under a wheat field there, uh, found a 1,430-pound uh, palisite meteorite is the largest oriented, and an oriented one is one that's shaped by the uh, the fireball process into a nose cone, the nose cone of a rock. And yeah, that uh, that was a story that the media. Um, uh, it must have been a slow news week. Um, they yeah, and I and I joke about that because you know every in Kansas every week there's a lottery winner that that's a bigger deal than you know the the monetary value of this thing, but. Um, there was something about that story that went viral, and um, dominoes started to fall, and that's that's what eventually um, one thing led to another that ended up, um, you know, was part of the narrative of, of my history, um, and it got to the to the television series and the half, and and the, the pinnacle of my career. I'm I'm here on your your show, <laughs> 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 um, and uh, but yeah, so you know, you never know. Uh, you, you're looking for little ones. You're happy with uh, little ones, and you know, I, I, I found a couple that weren't were not, relatively speaking, not so little before that one. But yeah, that one was the biggest of my career, and and uh, so and quite a notable God. find at that for sure. Uh, you're on the yeah. air with myself and Steve Arnold. Go ahead, caller. Hey, this is Kevin Strahan. Hello, Kevin. I was just curious. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't mean to call so late. I sit there and listen to it, and I forget uh, I need to call in, and I'm just getting interested in the show. So uh, I'll, I always have to wait to the last minute when you say the show's about to end. I'm like, oh, crap, I hadn't called. <laughs> but 
what uh I, I just on average and this is gonna be a guess what on average do you think uh, how many meteorites actually fall to the earth whether it be the golf ball size or marble size in in a year <laughs> i you know i i don't know numbers get thrown around i i don't actually try to go figure it out because to be honest i i don't care i i care about the ones that are potentially findable um the, the ones that that we can narrow down um and it's worth investing the time to go look um and i you know i would say in the united states there's probably one a week on average that hits the ground, and if there were people within, um, you know, that within driving distance where they would drop what they're doing and go hunt, one a week that could be recovered if people were educated enough to look what to look for. Practically speaking, it's usually one or two or three a year in the United States that end up producing rocks. And sometimes um, one will go through the roof of a house and it makes it real easy because, you know, there's sheetrock and plaster all over a guy's living room. Um, that makes it really right. easy Follow to find that rock. <laughs> yeah. Um, th- this one down in Marshall last week, um, there's signs of hundreds of pieces and um in my first ten hours I hadn't I didn't find anything. So um you know it, it's hard to say. Um and that's sort of where if you're wanting to chase fireballs, um you need to go through that learning curve because it really doesn't matter what the average is. It's it's if one lands within, you know, distance of you going, um and that's a relative term because if there's thousands of rocks on the ground, um, it's a little easier to get on the airplane and fly somewhere um, versus while wow, there was there was a sonic boom and a flash of light, is there something on the ground? Uh, and the sonic boom is a is a key factor. Um, if something's going faster than the speed of sound and it's a physical body, you're, you're going to get at least one sonic boom. And so, and that's usually within 30 to 40 miles of where rocks are on the ground. So that, there's a website called the American Meteor Society and it's amsmeteors.org. It's very easy to find if you just Google fireball reports or whatever. It pops up. Um, they report every, every fireball that lands. I think we're up, we're up at 2,500, something like that on this year alone. Wow. Um, most of those are not going to produce something, but you know, one or two percent of that um, probably have some something on the ground. So if something's in your neighborhood, um, you can if you can get uh, some good triangulation, whether it's uh, video or eye, eyewitness reports. God bless people, but geez, they're wrong. You know, oh yeah, well, I was driving down the road and it went from there to there. Well, okay. You know, if if we got video or if we have the sonic booms, we have Doppler radar, okay, that's a little more trustworthy than Uncle Jeb saw something land on the other side of that tree. Um, and and right. one of the things, if you're sitting under a tree, I mean, it looks like the moon is right there in the branches. No, it's a little farther out. Same way with a fireball. It's impossible to tell is it a mile away or is it is it 200 miles away. It, it's it's you just can't tell. You just yeah, it's impossible to gauge the distance the when it's in the sky. Hill. Pardon me. It's impossible to gauge the distance practically when it's in the sky falling and you're it just is. standing there. It is impossible, and 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 especially fireballs can be different brightnesses and and wet, you know. And so is something really huge and it's it's a long ways away or something relatively small and really close. You you just can't tell. So going to that website is all of a sudden if there's someone in Georgia that sees something and someone in Ohio that sees something and someone in Arkansas that sees something and oh wow it it sort of it probably landed in Tennessee. Okay. You know and if some of the reports of some you know sonic booms in somewhere in Tennessee then you go okay 
It probably landed in Tennessee. You want to get in your car and drive to Tennessee and pick it up? Uh, maybe, maybe not. So right. that's part of you. You can spend a lifetime chasing fireballs and never find something. Um, uh, or, or you can be a little bit selective and have a better chance of finding things. All right. Well, hopefully that answers your question and thanks for the call, Kevin. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Well, there has certainly been a lot of information covered, uh, and obviously you can't ever cover it all in one show, but I know that uh, you've probably got things that you need to be doing, too, and I appreciate you sitting down and taking the time to talk with us. Before you go, though, why don't you let everybody know where they can find your uh, physical brick-and-mortar store and uh, even a couple of your pages, if you'd like, and any sort sure. of quick advice to newcomers into meteorite hunting. Yeah, um, uh, probably the best place is to follow me on Facebook, for those of you that are there. Um, uh, Steve Arnold Meteorite. I, I do have a Facebook page for the store, but oftentimes it's just more store stuff. So unless you've been to the store, that's not as well relative. Uh, my wife uh, is, uh, yells at me for friending everybody who asks me on Facebook personally. But um, unfortunately, Facebook only really lets personal posts go out to about 10% of the people anyway. So um, if you follow me, the odds of getting the information are a little bit a little bit better that way. Um, uh, we sell stuff on eBay. Uh, you know, here's the here's the blatant uh, 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 capitalistic uh, commercial plug here, but I do have a personal belief that meteorites make wonderful Christmas gifts. Um, it's it's a gift that even for five, ten, twenty, fifty dollars, you can give someone something. First of all, they're going to remember it the rest of their life. They're going to remember that you gave them that gift the rest of their life. Um, I dare say uh, the Walmart gift card or the iTunes gift card, a year later they're not going to even remember the, what you gave them, much less what they bought with it. Um, they're probably going to, when they're 90 years old, they're going to still have that either right you gave them. And you might be able to inspire someone, especially a youth, um, to investigate um, um, the science is a little bit more um, in the society that tends to worship uh, um, sports and music uh, people um, a little bit more. So I, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, one other little commercial plug, I have a Kickstarter program where I'm trying to raise um, money to buy a Martian meteorite. And uh, I won't say anything other than you can go to kickstarter.com and look up Martian uh, you'll find it there. Um, I think we're about a thousand dollars away. We're we're eighty percent of the way to raising our funds to buying um, a Mars rock, and those will ship before Christmas. So um, eBay, uh, we always have some stuff. We'll load eBay up a lot thicker here at Christmas time as well. And you can, uh, if you're in the Eureka Springs, Arkansas area, come by and visit us. And um, if you have something personal. Uh, I can answer some questions or help you find a meteorite if you contact me on Facebook or at Meteor Hunter, N E T E O R H N T R, no vowels in the Hunter part, Meteor Hunter at AOL.com. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And for us as hunters, it may not be a bad idea to possibly uh, purchase a small piece of meteorite as a sample so we know what we're mm -hmm. looking for. Exactly. Um, we can get you a little, a little twenty, thirty dollar piece um, for for metal. For your, that's a typical stone meteorite that you, you can play around with a detector and bury it if you want to. Um, we can get you a little all iron one if you think you might be um, swinging in areas where you might find an all metal one. Although, uh, with, with pure honesty, uh, a, a bolt. Or a hammer will give you about the same signal that a meteorite will. It's all iron, but they don't look as cool. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, I certainly appreciate you taking the time. Hang in there with me for a minute, and we'll get out of there. Uh, right. Folks, if uh, you enjoyed the show, you found something enlightening here or some information that you like, by all means, please like and rate the channel, click the pink hands. Let us know you enjoyed it. Drop me a comment. Or, 
If you'd like to be a guest on the show or know of an interesting topic to cover, like I said, I'm not hard to find, and really, it's painless. You might even have some fun with it. You never know. Drop me a line. We'll talk about it. But for everyone else, stay persistent, watch the skies, get out there, and by all means, look around and try and find something. Uh, for myself and Steve Arnold, we've got to go, but uh, there's always next week. Tune in, folks. We'll see ya.